Hello and welcome, my name is Ryan, I'm also known as RM2K Dev. In the last video, we dealt with the POS packet on our server side of things. We've also echoed that information out to all of the other connected clients in the game. In this video, we're going to be dealing with our network player object and we'll also be instantiating them onto our map. And hopefully if we get time, we'll also be updating their positional data as the POS packet arrives at the client. So let's begin by creating a new player object under the players uh, group in the objects uh, section of our game maker project. I'm gonna call this one OBJ for object and we'll call it network underscore player. So it's object underscore network underscore player. And I hope you guys are using these naming conventions because I have had a look in the comments and I see a lot of people um, not using good naming conventions in their uh, projects. So make sure you're using good naming conventions because it, it makes things a lot easier to understand when you're reading them back a week later um, and you don't remember what you were doing. So it makes it a lot easier. We're gonna give this a sprite of the SPR hero down sprite and that's just going to be our default facing down position. We might add directions into this, we might not, I'm not sure yet. It depends on how much time I have to record these videos. Um, now that our network player object is uh, is in existence, we're gonna do a very similar thing that we did with the player object, and that is at a create event. And inside of that create event, we're going to have the same variables that we had last time. Moving equals false, target X equals X, and target Y equals Y. Now the reason for this is because we're going to be doing a very similar way of getting our player to move and that's using the almost the same code, I think, to that if target x is greater than x, then x plus equals 4. Um, and we don't need to deal with moving or any of those other states because this is not our player. That's being dealt with by the other client and the server is merely sending out updated positional information. So if I add a new step event into our game, uh, sorry, into our object network player. We're going to add the four, I'm just gonna load them up now, the four movement commands that we added in our object player. And those were, uh, if target X is greater than X, X plus equals four. If target X is less than X, X negative equals four. And if target Y equal, is greater than Y, then Y plus equals four. And if target Y is less than Y, Y negative equals four. So basically now our network player will move around automatically for us on the screen. And I think that's all we need to do to get our network, our network player um, actually working. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna select okay. Um, I also our network player does not need to be persistent. So um, don't make the network player persistent because it's, it's not going to work. So definitely not persistent. We might change that later, I'm not certain, but I don't, I'm pretty sure we don't want them to be persistent. Actually, I'm certain at this point in time, we don't want them to be persistent. So in our handle packet function, we need to add a new case statement to deal, to deal with, um, to deal with POS packets. So let me load up my sample code here so I can see what we're doing. And that's going to be, POS, here it is. Okay, so in a POS packet, we have the username, the target X and the target Y position. We also don't know if that player exists on our map. So I'm gonna add a case POS coming back from the server. And that's pretty much all we need, yep. So now we need to read in a string of information. So I'm just gonna copy this one here and paste it down there. And we're gonna change that so that it reads username is going to be the first argument and it's of type string in our argument zero. I'm gonna add two more of these and that's gonna be our target X and target Y. So target underscore X and we also need one for target underscore Y. And if I remember correctly, those were uh, 16, they will be 16, 16-bit unsigned integers coming back from the server. That's only because on our server side, we have a simplified version of the buffer system set up and that is happening in our packet.build. So these need to be buffer underscore u16 for unsigned 16-bit integer underscore u16. You might be wondering why I've done that 
like this in this instance. And the reason is just because if I jump back into our server, uh, our server project here, and if you have a look at our packet.js um, build packet function, if it's a number, if, if the value coming in is a number, and it is going to be a number, even though we sent it from the client to the server as a 32-bit uh, signed integer, it's still going to arrive on the JavaScript side as a number. And I'm treating all numbers going out of the server as unsigned 16-bit integers in long endian, sorry, little endian format, um, just because we we might not always be using a number for positional data. So the number in some cases might be negative or below zero. Um, and that's why I'm using an unsigned 16 bit. I've only chosen 16 bits because I was thinking about uh, network performance. I didn't want the packet to get too big, but you could definitely expand out that packet.build function to take in uh, into account um, I don't know, uh, information about, you know, what size of integer you want to send back and forth. You could expand that out so that instead of using an array, it used a JSON object, and that JSON object stored a lot more details about what the data type actually is and what data type to write into the buffer. But that is well beyond the scope of this tutorial. So for simplicity sake, I'm, simplicity sake, I'm hungry. Um, no, for simplicity sake, I've just chosen to send uh, numbers back from the server to the client as unsigned 16-bit uh, integers. And if none of that made sense, just ignore it and move on. Um, so now that we've got the player's X, Y, and username, we need to we need to do a check to see if the player exists on our map. So we just say found player equals negative one. Uh, and obviously, when we're dealing with IDs, negative one is does not exist. And then we can say with object underscore network underscore player. So basically with every single object network player on the map right now, we're going to check and see if their name is the same as the name that we have just received positional data for. So we say if name equals other dot username, remembering that other will take us out of the scope of this with and back into the scope of our case statement, which contains a username variable, then if those conditions were true, we need to say other.foundPlayer equals ID. So we're going to store the ID of this player into this into this other.foundPlayer variable. And if that if that happens, we don't need to continue traversing through all of the objects for performance reasons. We're going to exit this with loop. Um, if it makes it to the end of this with loop and does not match a name with an object that exists then obviously that player doesn't exist and we need to create the player. So we're gonna deal with that now. So just below that we say, if found player not equals negative one. So if it wasn't negative one, it means that we did actually find a player. We're gonna deal with that in a second, but we say else, which means if it was negative one, we didn't find a player, then we need to create a network player for this player. So we're gonna say, with instance create, this is very much the same as the, um, the the one that we did for our own player, instance underscore create. We're going to create it at target underscore x and target underscore y. And it's going to be of type object underscore network underscore player this time. Now, because our game revolves around the idea that the username is what we're using to look up players and, and see whether or not they exist and things like that. Well, with this new instance that we just created, we need to say that the name is equal to other.username because that way, when we receive positional data for them again in the future, we have something for this first function to actually go back and reference to make sure that that object exists. And if the object does exist, then we need to update their target X and target Y. So we do that in our if found player not equals negative one. We say with found player, since we know who it is and we have the ID of that player, then we can say something along the lines of target underscore X equals other dot target underscore X and target underscore Y equals other dot target underscore Y. Now, when we're, so basically our positional data is, is completed. Um, when we have multiple people on in, in logged into the game, we should be able to see them moving around now. So let me save this 
project. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compile an application version of this now so that I can run two or three instances of it. And I will log into the game on both of those instances and show you what happens. So give me two seconds to do that and I'll be back when that's done. Okay, I'm back with two instances of the game client running now and I have not tested this so hopefully it all works but I'm going to log in with A. Now A is on the map. I'm also going to log in as my own character, RM2K Dev, one, two, three, four, log in, and RM2K Dev is on the map. Now if I move, you should see both of these characters will now appear on each other's maps. Now that's because we moved, the positional data packet went and said, hey, this player doesn't exist on the map, we need that player to exist on the map, create them. Now if I move again, you should see that the player does not get recreated because this time the loop found the player that existed on the map by the username that was sent from the client to the server and it actually moved that player on the screen, on the other screen. So if you, I'm controlling the bottom left one here, as you can see by the fact that the camera is following that player. And as I move around, you should see that these two players are perfectly lined up the animations will be offset because they were created at different times, but we are now able to move around on each other's screen. Now, this would be slightly confusing because you can't see the other player's name. So what I'll do is I'll quickly jump into our code and we'll add a display for that. So go into object player, we're gonna add a draw event. I'm gonna drag a code segment into the draw event. And we, in that code segment, we will basically just say draw underscore self. So we're drawing the picture of, of, the, of the character. And then we need to draw the character's name onto the screen centered above the character. And we do that simply by saying draw underscore text. And we pass into that the X position, which is gonna be X minus, and then I'm gonna do a small calculation, string width, and it's going to be the width of name, because that's the that's the string, divided by two. So we get half of the width of name and we subtract that from X, which puts our string at the center of our player. And then we want to put it at Y negative 42. Now remembering that our player's offset is at 32 pixels because it's a 64 by 64 size sprite. If we subtract 42 from the center of our sprite upwards, we're going to be slightly above the player's head, which is exactly what we want to happen. And the string that we want to draw onto the screen is just the name. Now, if we copy all of this text, all of this code and save our object player, we'll go into our object network player and add the same thing into our draw event for that player. So that, that one gets its name drawn on above its head. If I save this and I will compile a new build as a single runtime executable and replace the one that's already there. And when that's done, we will launch two instances of our game and I will show you what that looks like. Okay, I'm back with two instances of our game running. You'll see that we have A, and if I log into the second client with rm2k dev, one, two, three, four, log in, these players now have their names above their heads. And you'll see that as we make movements, that, that state will persist into the other client. So hopefully this has shown you guys a little bit about how to create um, a fairly decent and reliable um, server client network architecture. Um, yes, yeah, so I hope this has actually been a lot of help to some of you guys. This is probably going to be one of the last videos I do on this series. Um, there might be more. I haven't done a couple of features yet, like uh, facing direction and things like that. But I hope that by this point, in this, in this tutorial, you've actually learned enough about how the server's working and how data gets sent back and forth between a client and a server and gets echoed out to all of the other clients, like the way that we did the, um, the way that we did the movement packet, uh, the way that it doesn't send it back to the client that already has the information yourself, but it sends it to everyone else who's on the map. And just to test this out a little bit more, I'm gonna launch a couple more clients just to show you guys how reliable this system is. Okay, so I'm back with about six, seven clients running at one time. My own PC probably couldn't handle any more than this. Don't forget that my own PC is the server as well as seven clients, as well as the rendering and the handling and the logic of all seven clients at once. Um, 
Granted, it is a fairly powerful PC, but I don't think it's powerful enough to play seven games and host the game at the same time. Um, but just to show you guys how reliable and how um, instantaneous th this server actually is, this architecture that we've created, I'm going to take my RM2K dev character and I'm just going to move around. Uh, that's this window right here. I'm going to place it in the center so that you guys can see that window as the main focus. And I'll just move some of these ones here around a little bit just to make it a little bit easier for you to see. There we go. And as I move RM2K dev around, you can see that his position is tracked on all of these clients absolutely perfectly with no issues. Um, obviously, when he goes out of view, he goes out of view on the clients that don't need to see him. Um, but while he's on this map, they are receiving positional information about this character that's moving around. And there's absolutely no errors with the tracking. If I, if I just, if I keep pressing buttons like crazy, all of the clients um, have RM2K dev in the exact same space. So like I was saying, I hope this tutorial series has been a lot of help. It would be awesome of you and a lot of help to me if you could go back to episode one and give that a like. Um, there might be a couple more videos in this tutorial series about some additional functionality, but if there are, they will be, um, there'll be more like extensions that we add to this. And I, I really hope that at this point in the tutorial series that I've shown you guys enough about how the architecture works to actually go out and continue expanding it in your own games. And this doesn't have to just work for a little RPG game like this. This can work for, um, you know, top down shooters, this networking, if you have uh, the master collection or a collect or the, the, the export functions for game maker, this will actually deploy to a Mac. It will work on an iPhone and Android. It may work in the HTML5 browser. I'm not certain about that. But for all of the actual physical targets that have actual hardware and socket capabilities, this will work so that you can write MMO games now for any platform, which is fairly powerful. With that said, um, a good place to host your server would be on Amazon S3 and if not S3, sorry, Amazon EC2. It's fairly cheap. I run my own servers there. I think it costs me about 12 to $15 a month. So fairly cheap uh, servers there and you'll be able to get your games working on those servers because they're Linux machines. All you need to do is install Node.js using the Linux um, the Linux setup and you can use other providers for your database as well. You don't have to install the data, the data, um, the actual database server. There are cloud based server providers out there. I think, um, one of them is called Mongo lab. That's a good one. So mongolab.com or just Google Mongo lab. Um, there's, there's a lot of different places you, you'd be able to set your server up on a Heroku server, um, Amazon EC2. You could use a droplet in digital ocean, there are absolutely no limitations to where you can put your server. So thank you for watching. I think I've said that like eight times now. This will be the last time I say it. Um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the series. Please leave comments and like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It really does help me actually create these videos knowing that there is an audience out there who is uh, willing to watch them. So thank you guys. Bye.